Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai Madhava Kunjabi Hari This chapter is entitled, Indra Offends Brihaspati. Om Namo Bhagavate Bhāsudevāya 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 is on the board, they can see it, but it's backwards. You know how to flip it around in Facebook? So they don't see everything as a mirror image? Is there a way to do that? Because it's so nice, you can see the verse, but it's backwards. <laughs> anyway, this is chapter, uh, Canto 6, chapter 7, text 13. 
Yapara. <laughs> you want to do each word? Okay. Parameshtyam, Ishanam, Adishtan, excuse me, Adishtitan, Na, Kanchana, Padyutishad, Iti, Briyur, Dharmam, Te, Na, Param, Viduhu. Ya parameshtam dishanam, Ya parameshtam dishanam, Adityishtam nakanchana, Adityishtam nakanchana, Pradyutishtam iti bruyur, Dharmante na param vidu, Dharmante na param vidu, Ya parameshtam dishanam, Aditishtana Kanchana Aditishtana Iti Bruyur Dharmantena Param Vidu Yaha, Yaha, anyone who, anyone who, Parameshtyam, Parameshtyam, royal, Dishanam, throne, Adishtam, sitting on, Na, not, Kanchana, anyone, Pradyutishtet should rise before Iti thus Bruyuhu those who say Dharmam the codes of religion Te they Na not Param higher Viduhu no Translation. If a person says, one who is situated on the exalted throne of a king should not stand up to show respect to another king or a brahmana, it is to be understood that he does not know the superior religious principles. Purport.
It's very interesting to see words backwards. It looks like Russian. Sort of. I thought it was in Russian. Srila Vishnath Chakravarti Thakur says in this regard that when a president or king is sitting on his throne, he does not need to show respect to everyone who comes within his assembly, but he must show respect to superiors like his spiritual master, Brahmanas and Vaishnavas. There are many examples of how he should act. When Lord Krishna was sitting on his throne and Narada fortunately entered his assembly, even Lord Krishna immediately stood up with his officers and ministers to offer respectful obeisances to Narada. Narada knew that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and Krishna knew that Narada was his devotee. But, although Krishna is the Supreme Lord, and Narada is the Lord's devotee, the Lord observed the religious etiquette. Since Narada was a brahmachari, a brahmana, and an exalted devotee, even Krishna, while acting as a king, offered his respectful obeisances unto Narada. Such is the conduct visible in the Vedic civilization, a civilization in which the people do not know how the representative of Narada and Krishna should be respected, how society should be formed, and how one should advance in Krishna consciousness. A society concerned only with manufacturing new cars and new skyscrapers every year, and then breaking them to pieces and making new ones, may be technologically advanced, but it is not a human civilization. A human civilization is advanced when its people follow the Chaturvarnya system, the system of four orders of life, there must be ideal first-class men to act as advisors, second-class men to act as administrators, third-class men to produce food and protect cows, and fourth-class men who obey the three higher classes of society. One who does not follow the standard system of society should be considered a fifth-class man. A society without Vedic laws and regulations will not be very helpful to humanity, as stated in this verse. Dharmam te na param vidu. Such a society does not know the aim of life and the highest principles of religion. Shrimate Bhakti Vedanta Shamini Tinamane Namaste Sharashati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nabise Satanibhari Pachar Satanam. In Bhagavad Gita there's a verse. Yashastra Vidhim. The injunctions, the injunction, injunctions of Shastra. Yashastra Vidhi. Vidhi means rules and regulations. Yashastra Vidhi Utsrija. Utsrija means to give up. The Shastra Vidhim Utsrija Vartate Kama Karata One who gives up the injunction of Shastras and acts whimsically. So the connotation is the Shastras are rules by which we, one should act, human beings should act, and if one doesn't follow those, they're not following because they're acting whimsically. Whimsically means have whatever you feel like, right? How do you, what do you feel like right now? I, I feel like this. Then do it. That's what people want to do. Isn't it, more or less? So Krishna is saying, it's whimsical action. And nasasidhim, about noti, you won't become perfect in your life. Now, 
nasasukin, nasasukam avapnoti. Na, na param, yeah, you won't, you won't, you can't perfect, perfect your life, you won't become happy that way. And so, of course, it's counterintuitive. Who would think that by restricting oneself you'll be happy? We would think doing whatever we want will be happy. And, you know, if I have enough money and power to do whatever I want, I'll be really happy. So, here's an example. I am a king, I'm sitting on the throne, another king comes or another Brahmin comes, and I just don't feel like standing up. Why should I? Why should I bow down to anybody? I don't feel like it. And because I don't feel like it, the modern world puts so much value on individual expression and feeling, doesn't it? We see what's going on in the last year or two. You have to respect my individual expression. Okay, we don't mind respecting people. But um, democracy is kind of based on this idea. Let, let the common denominator of the people rule and determine what is the next standard, what is the next right and wrong. So of course, every generation has their own standard of right and wrong. I'm going to tell you something. You're going to find this really interesting. I don't know about your country, but I assume it's similar. Up until 1923 in America, it was illegal for a man to go to be at the beach without a shirt. Did you know that? They had to wear a shirt. Men had to wear a shirt. It was considered illegal. So you're sitting here in 2022 and you're thinking, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Well, you're devotees. Maybe you don't think it's stupid, but I'm sure the average person would think that's so Victorian or whatever word you want to use, right? So if you lived 100 years ago, you would think if you saw a man without a shirt, that's indecent. You would think like that. Of course, you don't think that now, but you would think like that. Isn't that interesting? So, that's the standard. Now we have a different standard. So I think the point is obvious that Prabhupada's making. If, if democratically we create standards and we're not Brahmins, then all we can say is, good luck everyone, you're going to have problems. And um, not you're going to have, we have many. So, whenever Prabhupada talks about Barnashram, the real point Prabhupada has made many times is he said, a body can exist without legs, but it can't exist without a head. It can exist without arms, but it can't exist, well, it can't really exist without a stomach. But let's say theoretically you could live intervene, with intravenous feeding, you could live without a stomach, but you can't live without a head. So, Prabhupada's mission was to make Brahmins, not out of everyone, but some. And Prabhupada said, I think, I think he said 1%. If 1% of the population becomes genuine Brahmins, that could actually change the entire world. And all the political movements in the world cannot be as effective as 1% as Brahmins, because if political leaders don't understand dharma, what can they do? Create some laws, try to fix a problem, and we see how that works. So now, ladies and gentlemen, Prabhupada wanted you to be Brahmins, because without Brahmins, society is going quickly, it's right, it's from a purport, Prabhupada, that society is very quickly we say going to the dogs, he said going to hell. Literally going to hell, because that's where most people will end up due to their sinful activities. So, I have a, something interesting for you. And you've probably, maybe you're aware of this, but some of the people who were instrumental in creating the internet, who were instrumental in creating Facebook and creating the whole all the paradigms of Facebook, were interviewed, and they were asked, do you regret having done that? And they say, yes. 
Another man who was actually a Brahmin, he doesn't know he's a Brahmin, but he's acting as a Brahmin, he said that capitalism uncontrolled is going to destroy us. Therefore, any time a product is to be released or a company wants to create a product, there should be a class of men who will determine, who, should, who somehow will determine the consequences of releasing this product on society. And if it's considered that this prog progress would be detrimental to the well-being of people, it would not be allowed. That's what a Brahmin would do. Because Brahmins are interested in the well-being of people. And what are capitalists interested in? The well-being of people? You know, a few maybe, you know, some products that are... But I read this article, it said, most companies, or many companies, start out with a very exalted mission. Um, but after three years, they realize they're not going to make a lot of money if they stick to that mission because it's, it's some other company is willing to do anything and anything to smash them and compromise on the quality of the product or the service, and they can't compete. So when the bottom line is money, you compromise. That's why the Brahmins were the advisors to the Chatris. The Chatris were advisors to the Vaishyas. And, and the Shudras would serve them because the Brahmins were reliable. Why were they reliable? They were educated, number one. And they were self-controlled, so they had no personal interest. There was, to be a Brahmin, you have nothing to gain by any decision you make. And how can you make a good decision if you have something to gain? It's a conflict of interest. So you have to have people who can gain nothing. And they, who want it, not that they can't gain anything, they don't want to gain anything, so there's no vested interest in their decision. Well, what if I make this decision that this product doesn't come out? Then my brother-in-law who's working for this company is going to lose his job. Brahmins don't think like that. Brahmins think what is best for the welfare of society. And then the Chatriyas follow the Brahmins. So the Chatriyas are, they can, you know, get overcome by the by greed and power, um, but being guided by the Brahmins, it doesn't happen. And so you go down the line, the same thing with the Vaishyas. Who is responsible for destroying the planet? Okay, we are. But companies provide us with products that are created through destroying the planet, and then we support them. But if those products didn't exist, we would um, not have such a big responsibility in ruining the planet, because we couldn't, right? So, if there were Brahmins, if we had Brahmins ruling society since the time of Lord Krishna, I don't think we'd have any problem with ecology, because in these big cities, they just wouldn't happen. I was once with Prabhupada, and we were walking, in, actually we were walking in a park in San Diego called Balboa Park. There's a few buildings in it, but mostly it's just like fountains and grass, more or less, right? Some, you know, not that many buildings, but one part of it, there's like no buildings. You know, along, I forget what it is, Park Avenue or something, or whatever. One, our temple used to be three blocks from it, so I used to walk there. And so Prabhupada came to that temple and he walked there. And the place, part we're walking was, there might have been one building in a mile. But you could see other buildings in the distance. And, and the devotee asked Prabhupada, is this like Vrindavan? And he said, no, it's like Dwarka. Because Vrindavan didn't, didn't have all these buildings. Okay, it's like Dwarka, and mostly it was park. <clears throat> so, I don't know if it was this discussion, but later there was a discussion, as far as I remember, in which Prabhupada said, according to Shastra, cities should max out at 50,000. That's as big as a city should be, 50,000. Yeah, that's like a neighborhood in London, right? <laughs> 10 blocks, right? Maybe like 10 square blocks or 5 square blocks, that's like 50,000. And in the Bhagavatam, Prabhupada said, in Dwarka, any, from any position in Dwarka, you could see nature. You could see a park, you could see a pond, you could see a lotus flower, you could see swans. He said, that's a city. I have a question. 
Are people in London more depressed than people in Hawaii? I think so. Hawaii is a nice ocean. Palm trees, mangoes, papayas, stays, mountains. So do you think Brahmins would allow cities to be built like London, New York, congested, what to speak of, Mumbai, Delhi? It's impossible, never. It wouldn't happen. Do you think they would allow huge factories where people have to work like robots in some very uh, unhealthy environment? Of course not, they wouldn't. Because the Brahmins are concerned not only with people's spiritual advancement, they're concerned with people's material welfare because your material welfare affects your spiritual. You know, if, you're, if you're working in a very Thomistic environment, that's going to have a very bad effect on you. I mean, some of you will probably have this experience. You, know, you think, well, if I have good sadhana, everything's good. But if your life is, if you're confronting very Thomistic situations in your life, you see how that affects you. It disturbs your mind. And it makes it difficult for your spiritual life. So, so back to the point that Prabhupada understood that if we are going to do anything that's going to benefit the world, we have to create a class of Brahmins. So you know who he, who he was counting on to do that? I'm looking at them right now. He was counting on us. And I know, I don't want to put you in anxiety. I guess it's too late, I just did. <laughs> but um, it's a burden of love. Prabhupada wanted us to be those people who are concerned about the welfare of others, not, cons not obsessed with selfishness. Those people who understand Shastra who under can understand etiquette and so forth. So it's a real challenge for us because we weren't raised this way. You know, Prabhupada talks about the first, second, third, fourth, and the fifth. Were you wondering who the fifth is? Any of you wondering who that fifth class is? That's us. Unless you were born in a Varnashram culture, we're the fifth class. That means we were not raised according to Vedic principles. That's fifth class, outside of that. And so the people outside of that are the people Prabhupada's hiring to create the cultivated culture. It, it poses a challenge. We have fifth class samskaras. We do things that are not brahminical and we don't even know it because we weren't raised that way. We do it all the time. We don't know. So we have to learn what are Brahminical principles. We have to learn proper etiquette, how to respect, who to respect. Like we were talking last night, if we have disagreements or, or we see something needs to be talked about, someone's doing something wrong, how to do that in a way that doesn't offend everybody, how to do that in a respectful, humble way. That's the problem. I'm not saying that we don't know how to do that. I'm just saying... We weren't, most of us were not trained. We might have been trained by good parents and like that, but there's so many standards of rabbinical standards that uh, we, were, we don't know. Even, even after being a devotee, we may not know all of them. And so Prabhupada wants us to learn them. When simple things, and you may not under, even understand why to do these things, but they're rabbinical. So... In, in October of 1970, there were around 30 devotees that went to India from America. Prabhupada wanted to show off the fact that you Indians are not becoming Krishna conscious, but the Americans are. So since you follow America, maybe you might be interested in knowing this. Maybe that will, maybe that will stimulate you, inspire you. So he brought Americans with him. So India has a culture. Certain things are done a certain way, and some of this culture is coming down from Vedic culture, Brahminical. It may be coming from Muslim culture, it may be coming from British culture, but there are certain principles. 
And one of the principles is that whenever you give or take something, it should be with your right hand. Whenever you eat, you should eat with your right hand. The left hand is only reserved for dirty business. So I was with a God brother once, and he was left-handed. And we were on the street in Calcutta, and it was very hot, and he got something to drink, like a soft drink. And he was drinking it with his left hand because he's left-handed. And we're on the street, and somebody goes like this. Right hand, right hand. Just somebody walking down the street. <laughs> Don't drink with your left hand. That's considered, in India, it's considered. Like even, nobody does that, right? Isn't it? It's like, you know, not even culture, you just don't do it. Whenever you're given something, you take in your right hand, or you take two hands like this. But not like that, right hand. You give it, you take it. You eat prasadam with your right hand. So all these American devotees were coming. They were being, they, they, had, they had become guests of very cultured people. And... I, I know you guys in England, you eat with like a fork or something. How do you do it? <laughs> a fork and a knife or some weird thing, isn't it? What's, what's the British way of doing it? Fork? Fork in your left hand? Or a fork in your right hand, knife in your left? Yeah. I'm not sure actually what you're doing. Oh, you're cutting? That's for meat though, isn't it? Cut. Um, yeah, my sister went to a high-class school in Switzerland, very, very sophisticated. You had to eat potato chips with a fork. But um, anyway, but in India, you cannot eat with your left hand. You will drive people crazy. They'll want to chop your neck off. So devotees, of course, many were eating with their left hand. And Prabhupada told them, he said, sit on your left hand. Just like it was the only way he, he could get them. And we might think this seems like really not that important. But in that country, in that culture, it is considered just the left hand is just contaminated. You don't touch prasadam is sacred. You avoid as far as possible touching anything sacred. Doing deity worship, sometimes we have to use both hands. But um, so, and people were telling Prabhupada, your disciples, you know, they don't know etiquette because they would see what the disciples would do. Uh, one time they were stealing sweets from the market. You know why they were stealing? Who could guess? Offer to the No, actually they're offering it to themselves. <laughs> Another guess. Why do you think they were stealing? Because... Everything belongs to Krishna. Yeah. Prabhupada, uh, one devotee told me that Prabhupada wanted us to spend time in India so we could learn the culture. I have a story for you. Would you like to hear it? Yeah. Very interesting. So I was teaching in the late 90s at the Vrindavan Institute of Higher Education in Vrindavan. And after the class, I think it was like a one-month class. It was, we had maybe like 50 students or so in the class. And there was one elderly, elderly gentleman. Well, he was elderly to me. He's probably not even old as I am now, but... Then he was considered elderly. So I was talking to a devotee who had a harmonium and I wanted to buy it. And there were like five, six, seven students in the room just happened to be there and he happened to be there. So we negotiated the price and I said, I'll get the money. I walked out and the man said, I'll buy it for you. And then I told the person who's in charge of the VIHG, I told him, I said, it's so nice, you know, this man, he was so nice, he was my student in this class, and he volunteered to buy the harmonium. And the person in charge of the VIHG said, yes, 
that is culture. You're his teacher. He couldn't, he couldn't allow you to pay for it because, you, you know, Guru Dakshina, like that. So um, when he said that is culture, then I remembered what Prabhupada said, you go to India to learn culture. I'll give you another story. I was with Jai Dwaita Swami in Dubai, and we were invited, yeah, it was Dubai, we were invited to a man's home, and so at lunch break he left his business, and we had prasadam. They bathed our feet, which I didn't want to do, and Mara said, you have to do it, because they want to do it. It's because, you know, traditionally the sannyasis, sadhus would go barefoot, so they bathe their feet. Clean. Anyway, it's, it's worship the sadhu. So you know, they had to get back to business. They had to get back to their business. And so they said to us, would you like, you know, we had finished eating, we were just talking to them, chit-chatting, and they said, would you like to leave now? And Mara said to me, that's the etiquette of saying, I have to get back to work, we need to go. So if that were America, and an American most likely would say, uh, excuse me, Raj, I have to get back to work, we're going to have to go now. But because they're Indian and they know etiquette, they say, would you like to leave now? You see? Subtle little difference, but and a difference indeed, because it, you wouldn't want to tell a sadhu what to do. You would want to be respectful and give them the choice of making the decision. And if you're smart like he was, he understands that out of respect for them, we should go because they need to go back to work. So these are little things, but if you see enough of these little things, you start to understand. Uh, something that's just, which is very, very Indian and not very Western is sometimes you'll see a guru in India, not necessarily in Iskand, but it may be also, very, give a lecture and he's very heavy. And he's telling people, like, what were they telling? You're fools. You're, you're stupid for doing this. You know, something like that. Anyone ever seen a lecture like that? And sometimes they're even screaming. So for us in the West, we'd be like, that's it. I'm never going to listen to that guru again. He's, you know, abusing me. But in India, I don't know about today, but at least previously, they would, they would think, I need to hear that. It's coming from a sadhu. What the sadhu says is purifying. So even though he's heavy, thank you, Maharaj, I need to hear that. I'm so attached. You told me I was an attached grihasta, attached to my body, attached to money in my home and kids, and I, I need to become more renounced. We in the West would say, this is offensive. Or we would use the word abuse, abusive. We could, right? We could think that way. But the respect for the sadhu is so high. I'm not saying that, you know, we uh, allow people to abuse us. I'm just saying that in that culture, there's so much respect for a sadhu that even if they do what we think is abusive, we don't, we wouldn't, they wouldn't take it that way. It's a different, a different kind of culture. The respect is, is very great. And sometimes the sadhu will speak that way on purpose. He's not angry, but he just feels people need to hear this. Because, you know, sometimes, have you ever been dealing with an attachment and you just like, or a problem, and you just can't let it go? It's like, I had this once. I was like, I had this attachment. It was, it was unhealthy and I couldn't let it go. And one sannyasi, he got so heavy with me. It was, just like, it, was like, it was like one sentence, but that sentence was so heavy, he completely knocked off that attachment for the rest of my life. It like never came back. And when he said it, it was like, who, like, who do you think you are to say that? Don't you have any respect? And he totally destroyed it. So sometimes, sometimes a sadhu will, sadhu, a sadhu will do that. It's not angry, it's just calculated. Prabhupada would do that sometimes. He'd get angry at someone to make a point. And then after, he was fine. He wasn't angry anymore. Because that person wouldn't understand. Unless 
he raised his voice. Sometimes it's like that. You don't understand something until someone is a little heavy. So that's also part of the culture. They know the sadhu is doing this not because he's angry or upset, but it's for you. He's trying to make a point. Yeah, he's trying to get it through. You might need it. He can be soft like a lotus, and he can be hard like a thunderbolt. So in that culture, in Vedic culture, the Brahmins, the sannyasis, the gurus, uh, were given the utmost respect. And that's why Prabhupada said that even Krishna worshipped Narada, because he wanted to show that, the, the importance of worshipping the sadhu, respecting the sadhu. Now, let's flip it around, because it's described here that when one is a king, one shouldn't be so proud that one thinks, I don't have to bow to anybody. This is a huge problem, and this is quite common when you're given power, it goes to your head. And, and so that's what's happening here. You have a position. Now, all of a sudden, because you have a position, you think you're better than everybody. And we were talking yesterday, a Vaishnava never thinks they're better than anybody. Prabhupada would sometimes say, I am learning from my disciples how to serve my spiritual master because I see how sincere my disciples are. He's the guru. He's the acharya. He's the only one who spread Krishna consciousness all over the world. And he's saying, I'm learning from my disciples. One time Prabhupada got upset at a devotee. A devotee was, he was by taking pictures constantly and Prabhupada couldn't focus on what he was doing. He was having a darshan. Click, 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 click. And he said, you know, he said something that, that hurt the devotee. And the, and the devotee, he left. And Prabhupada said, what happened to him? And they said, he was upset. Prabhupada said, go find him. They found him and brought him back. And Prabhupada apologized. So it's not that I am the guru, whatever I say is perfect. Prabhupada apologized. He realized that it hurt the devotee. So Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur said something very beautiful. He said, a pure devotee, no matter what position he's in, no matter how many followers he, ha he has, no matter what resources he has, no, ma no matter how much he's honored, he never, ever forgets that he's a tiny servant of Krishna. It never goes to his head. It's not possible. For us as conditioned souls, it's very possible, isn't it? It's very possible. So this story is beautiful because it, it's saying that no matter what position you're in, You should not be in a position where you think, now I don't have to respect Brahmins. Now I don't have to respect kings in Vedic culture. Kings are representatives of God. They're, they're honored by God. Brahmins, gurus, are rep representatives of God. They're honored by God. Now that I'm guru, I don't have to honor anybody. No. It's the opposite. So, if you ever have a position, I can guarantee you there'll be some challenge in which you'll think you are entitled to abuse somebody. This is, I'm not saying you will, but I'm saying there's a tendency that now that I have this position, I'm entitled to deal with you without the utmost respect. It's just the nature of the conditioned soul. That's why they say power corrupts. So if you ever get any power, any position of authority, the, utmost, the most important thing is don't ever lose your respect, don't ever lose your humility, don't ever think, because I have this position, I'm better. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta said something similar to what Prabhupada said when they asked him, how many disciples do you have? He had thousands. He said, I have four disciples. He had thousands, and he said he had four. He said, my four disciples are my two arms and my two legs. I tell them what to do, and they do it. He said, other than that, I don't have disciples. I am not master. I am servant. I have thousands of students which I serve. 
I am not. No, they are not disciples. That's how he saw. Isn't that interesting? I, I, do, I am not their master. I don't control them. I am their servant. So even on that level, a pure devotee will never become proud of his opulence, of his position, of his going to never misuse that control. Never feel that I have the right to treat someone with anything other than the utmost respect. That's the challenge when you get a position. And that's what's being discussed in this verse. Now I'm sitting on the throne, I don't have to respect anything. Right? It happens when you become wealthy. It happens when you become successful. What have you done in your life? You've done nothing. I've achieved this and that. You are nobody. It's dangerous. It's very dangerous. So at least we understand, we should understand, that if we're advancing in Krishna consciousness, we will not feel that way. And if we feel that way, that's a big red flag. There's something wrong. We're not advancing. You should always see that. If you ever feel that you've achieved something that makes you feel better than others, that should be a red flag. Because that's material consciousness. Isn't it? That's what the, that's what the material world's all about, outdoing one another. Upward mobility. You know, you remember that story? Prabhupada was in Japan. They were working with the printers there. The company was called Dynapon. All the early books were, for a certain period of time, the early books were printed there. The first Krishna book was printed there. BTGs were being printed there. So Prabhupada was going, I think, from Hawaii to somewhere, maybe to India. So they stopped in Japan to meet them. And uh, they had their meeting, they negotiated the price. And then one man wanted to meet Prabhupada. He was a young man. And uh, I think everyone had given Prabhupada a card, so maybe they were like 20 minutes of Prabhupada had a stack of business cards. And that man, that young man's card was there. And Prabhupada said, so what is your goal of life? He pulled out his card and put it on the top. He said, that's my goal, to be on the top of the pile. Right? And Prabhupada is saying, our goal is to be on the bottom of the pile. <laughs> Because when you're on the bottom of the pile, you're close to Krishna. The more you're a servant of the servant, the closer you are to Krishna. So, the problem that we all face is that we're conditioned souls. So the desire to put our card on the top of the pile, it's lingering within us to one degree or another, even if you think it isn't. It has to be, otherwise we would have love with Krishna if it wasn't. And we understand through philosophy that that's wrong. And sometimes when we understand through philosophy, we misunderstand that we actually feel that way because we understand it. Feeling it and understanding it are completely different. And so we're mostly, most of the time, we're involved with understanding, right? Like today's class. You understand that I should be on the bottom of the pile. And sometimes you will think, because I understand it, I actually feel that way. No, not necessarily. That's just an understanding. And sometimes we don't distinguish. Have you ever had that experience? You, you think you realize it because you intellectually understand it. Realizing it means you're living it, you're feeling it. Like, I want to be on the bottom of the pile. That's what I want. I've lost the desire to be on the top. I want to push everyone else to the top. When you feel it, that's different than when you understand it. Of course, you have to understand it before you can feel it. So, this is the challenge we all face. We come to Krishna consciousness as conditioned souls. We have these tendencies, and sometimes we don't, we think these tendencies are gone. Now I'm a devotee, I'm up in the morning chanting with the devotees, everything is amazing, I respect all the devotees, I think these tendencies are gone. Until there's some situation and it arouses it and you think, oh my God, I thought this was gone. Don't think it's gone. Until you're on a very high level of Krishna consciousness, 
it's not gone. You just have to control it and gradually purify it. But don't assume it's gone, because if you think it's gone, then you'll put your guard down. Think, no problem, they made me GBC Temple President Guru, like, no problem. No, it's going to be a problem if you're not careful, because the tendency to control, it's there within all of us. The tendency to be on with one again, isn't it? Now, you may be controlling it really well. That's good. Keep, keep doing it, but don't think just because you're controlling it, that tendency is entirely gone. It won't entirely be gone until you're more advanced. So, anyway, these are some thoughts. I'll end here. If you have any questions or comments, you can ask. Yes? Uh, I was just thinking that um, uh, the way the situation is now, the, bra the sugars get paid, and uh, the garnishment system is that the sugars don't get any pay, they just get them food and facility. Mm -hmm. So um, is it too far gone now to think that we can reverse the whole system? <clears throat> it seems... Well, Prabhupada's educating us in the system, so it seems that there's a possibility that someday that system may be feasible. Otherwise, I'm not sure why Prabhupada would have asked us to establish it and spent so much time explaining it. But whether that's going to happen or not, that's we're going to find out. Um, I don't think it's going to happen in a way we could understand other than maybe some shift in the world where... People are looking for alternatives and you know, are convinced that the, the current alternative does not work. The idea was, is that The, the thing is, for Varnashram to work, every ashram has to work. It can't just work with one ashram. The shudras are not paid, but they're taken, they're provided for, they're well, work, well cared for. They're not outcast of society, poverty-stricken, with no facility. You know, they, they have, it's not like that the king will provide for everyone. So if you want to say, okay, here's a class of men who are going to work but not get paid, you, they obviously have to be taken well care of, right? So they can say, okay, I don't need money. The idea was, if you give them money, they'll spend it on beer, basically. I mean, if they're in Scotland, we know that. And so, okay, we're going to do that. We're not going to give the shooters money, so now the beer companies are going to go out of business and we'll all get our heads chopped off. In, in the current scenario, you can't do anything that would destroy business. Make, we'll make meat eating illegal. You know. We'll become meat, the meat of the meat industry, if we do that. So Prabhupada said, this is an interesting point, Prabhupada said that social chain ha so social Social change has to happen from the people because then the people will demand leaders who will follow the principles they want them to follow. So if, if the whole world comes to the point where they want to be vegetarian, then they'll vote for leaders who will make laws to restrict the eating of meat. And so it won't be a problem anymore. So the idea is, the idea is then, um, if you educate people to the point where people demand change, then they'll vote for different leaders. Like we had in America. One of our devotees, Tosi Gabbard, was running for president. And in my estimation, the people were not ready for her. Because she was like too honest. 
and too smart, and she was like she didn't want to go to war. You know, Republicans in America, they you know they love war. It's like if there's a war to fight, they're in. And she's saying no. If she were president, there would have been no war in the Ukraine. I guarantee you. She understood that situation really well. She totally understood it. She could have made peace with Putin. She could have worked that out. People weren't ready for her. She was by far, I think, the most intelligent, most qualified woman. I mean, I'm not a politician, but um, if you look at everything she said like a year or two ago, it just played out exactly as she, she called it. It's, it's going to go this way. And then I was, I was seeing, you know, nobody was really interested in her. I think like people really are not ready for someone who's that smart and honest. That was my conclusion. So if governments are going to change, people have to change. They will demand different kinds of leaders. I mean, look at the kinds of leaders around the world that people vote for. It's kind of interesting. Isn't it? You know, it's not, you know, if people are not very intelligent and they vote for you, it's not a compliment. <laughs> the leaders think, you know, oh, I got so many votes. Yeah, because you're an idiot. You got, and, and the people, there's a lot of idiots in the country, so that's why you got all the votes. But if you're actually intelligent, you wouldn't have got all the votes. They, they, um, they did a, they did a joke once when Donald Trump was president. He said, Mr. Trump, your ratings are down. He said, yeah, the Americans have bad taste. That's the problem. So, they just have bad taste. I'm perfect. No, they have good taste. They have, yeah, they have bad taste. They voted for you. That's, that's proof. So, um, it's not a great honor to win an election if people are Shudra or less. And Bhagavatam says that. I know this sounds kind of heavy and offensive. But you know, who do people want in office? They want someone who can, um, if the economy is good, they'll vote for them, basically. Right? If, you know, if, I, if, you, if I can make the, if I can get you more money for your job, more work, and better health care, you'll, you'll vote for me. I don't have to do anything. I could be the biggest debauchee that you've ever seen. But if I can do that, you'll vote for me. From what I've seen. I don't know if it's that way in your country. I would assume so. So that was Prabhupada's mood. You know, let, we will educate society. Through the course of events, things will get worse because society is becoming more degraded. As it gets worse, we're giving the solutions. More and more people will see the solution. They'll want leaders who are more conscious, more spiritually evolved. And then maybe someday, when a devotee runs for office, they'll start voting for them. Now there's a devotee in America who's running for mayor, I believe, of a city in New Jersey. So obviously devotees will get involved in politics more and more. I mean, people don't know they're devotees, but... And there are cities, you know, like this city here, where there's so many vegans. Maybe you know, it's time for a vegan mayor, or something you know, who restricts meat consumption. And who knows, whatever. You know. Another answer to your question, or a general question, will: Could the world become Krishna conscious? Would it? Will it? Prabhupada was once asked that question, and he said, well, that will depend on us. Like, like, it can happen, Mahaprabhu predicted it, but someone has to do it. So, if we are pure enough and enthusiastic enough, Krishna can change the world in a way that we can have huge opportunities, opportunities for spreading Krishna consciousness. You know, when I was young, um, well, I, in my grammar school, we used to have these drills. I don't know, Pragyuma, they did it in your generation. You're a little younger than me, right? Oh, okay, so maybe you have the same thing. So, um, 
I remember in grammar school, the alarms would go off and you'd have to duck under your desk. You'd have to, yeah. You know why? That was an alarm in the event that the Russians would attack America. Right? Was it, were we afraid of a nuclear attack? Or I don't know if nuclear was, because that was like when I was, like, that was probably like 1958 or something. Maybe it was too soon. I think that what, the crisis in Cuba was like early 60s or something. But anyway, we were, uh, were fearful of being attacked by the Russians. So we had practices. Why am I saying that? What was the point? I lost track. What was the point I made before? You said you depend upon us. What's that? You depend upon us. Well, yeah, yeah. So, no, so, so, no, so what I'm saying, what I was, the point I was making is there is no place in our brain for thinking that Russia would be a free country. It was just like, it was like, you know, until the late 80s, that it was just like, no way. So, we're trying to preach in Russia, it's difficult, they're arresting us. And the only way we would be successful in Russia is something would have to change, and Krishna changed it. And it was obvious why. So that's just my, my sense of everything, that if something is going to happen on the major scale of spreading Krishna consciousness, it's probably going to be a combination of devotees Purity, enthusiasm, and world, and social changes in the world that make it make it to the point where maybe people are just frustrated with governments, and frustrated with what's going on, and all of a sudden eco village like people are starting. I'm moving out of the city. I'm, I, want, I need an eco village. Maybe maybe it'll come to a point where like you know half the city wants to live in an eco village ten years from now. You don't know, and you're sitting here and you had no idea. You go, ah, oh, we should have built skyscraper apartments here because. You know, Thousands of people want to come, or we should have built a thousand huts. Anyway, I wouldn't, you know, things like that can happen. And we're supposed to be ahead of the eight ball, so we know what the trends are, so, we, so when they happen, we're ready for it. And that could happen. I mean, Prabhupada said it would at some point. Once Prabhupada was in Atlanta, Georgia, and they were walking in a park, and you could see the skyline of downtown, he said, he said, someday the city will be empty. It'll just be full of criminals and everyone will be. He, then the devotee said, when, Prabhupada, in a thousand years? He said, no, in your lifetime. <laughs> so, you know, social upheaval can, can make differences. So, and then there, there's another story. 1975, Prabhupada was on a morning walk and he said, there's going to be World War Three. Kind of a shocker, right? Could you imagine? You know, Prabhupada was here, he went on a morning walk, and I'm sitting in class telling you what Prabhupada said. What did he say? What did he say? He said, there's going to be a war. You know, you're saying World War Three. that means, like, major disaster, right? Of course it didn't happen. So later... Like a year later, they said Prabhupada, or two years later, they said, Prabhupada, World War III didn't happen. Why? He said, Krishna changed his mind. He said, because of our preaching, he changed his mind. So, when I put all these things together, and I look at the world today, and I look at devotees, and, and the emphasis Prabhupada made on getting back to the land, and so forth, and how that movement to get back to the land. It's slow in this kind, it's slow in the world. It's just not, it's not a priority. Everybody's like, get me a corporate job in a big city so I can make six figures and drive a new car and live in a nice house. That's where everyone's at. So for that to change, something's gonna have to change. Like, like robots are gonna take all, all, over, all your jobs and you'll have no choice. You'll have no money, can't live in the city, You'll have to move. Something like that has to happen. And I, I, just based on what I've seen so far in the world, it seems like when we're ready, Krishna says, okay, next phase, let's do it. Let's move it to the next phase. So, 
Prabhupada seemed, they did predict that people would want to move out of cities into the country. So get ready, everyone. Order 1,000 yurts. You're going to get any yurts? You're going to get donations for yurts? Yes. Actually, Prabhupada. So when, when Prabhupada quoted, quoted those things, as, as far as I understand from studying all these quotes, is that like, it's kind of like, this is what could happen. This could be the scenario. If the world goes in a certain direction, where there's less and less food, less and less water, there's disastrous war. Prabhupada said there must be war, they'll use those bombs. If it goes in that direction, then yeah, they have no choice. And we have to be ready. So, let's get ready. And if it doesn't happen, well, we're, we're ready for whenever it does. And if it does, we're ready. Yeah. You know, I, I often think, I could be wrong, but I often think, well, if we're not ready, it's not going to happen. So, you know, if every farm in Iskand, you know, people come by the millions, so every farm in Iskand had room for 100,000 people, then Krishna would go, okay, it's time for World War III now, because we're ready. You know? <laughs> it's time for a famine, because we're ready. We have the food, we have this. So, it often works like that. Like, when you're ready, Krishna makes, he makes facility. You, know? and you may have that experience here. People are coming here to live, um, because you made facility because the community is more inviting and it's growing. When, when Prayuman and I were in San Diego, we had a bhakta program. And I remember people were coming from all over the United States to become devotees. And they could have joined any temple. But we had a really we had one of the best programs. I think at one point we had the best training program. So Krishna just sent them. And I would ask them, I'd say, why did you come to this temple in San Diego, California? And they said, well, I went through BTG, and it looked like a nice temple. No, that was super so. Telling them, this temple has a training program, you should go there. So, um, I don't know if I told you how the program started, but the program started with one of our godbrothers, Donavir, now Maharaj, and he started the program in Los Angeles because many people were coming to the temple, but they weren't, there was no one to, to really take care of guests and have a training program if they wanted to stay, and there was no program for guests to stay a weekend. So he started that program, and gradually he figured out how it should work. And when he figured out a system, then he came to San Diego, and, and, and we wanted to do the program. So the first thing he said is, move all the brahmacharis out of the ashram, and move them, in, so they move next door into a door. I don't know what we're using that for, next door house, but anyway. The next, they moved them all out, and he said, and put in bunk beds, by dodies, so whatever, how many bunk beds there were, like maybe 12 or something. Oh. There were three rooms, 12, 12 were 16. 16, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. The rooms and then we the and, yeah, and then we made an attic into it, like, and he said, so for every bed, two dodies, two cortas, toothbrush, two pairs of underwear, you know, like, you know, like, what are you talking about? We spend all this money, kick all the brahmacharis out. <laughs> And he goes, no, you have to do this. You just watch. <laughs> and so we did it. And so, you know, the first month, it was like, it was really weird. It's like you kicked all the brahmacharis out in this big ashram, and there's nobody in there. And stockpiles of towels, dhotis, toothbrushes, toothpaste, soap. And then gradually, they started coming. And so, you know, that was, that was such a beautiful lesson. Make the facility be able to take care of people, and Krishna will send them. From, and they, you know, most of them were not from San Diego, as I remember, or at least half of them, right? As I remember, were not locals. They came from somewhere, or at least many of them. 
And, and I think, all, I don't know if you felt like this, Pradyumna, but I felt like, I felt like there were some people who were ready to become devotees that Krishna said, not yet. And like, and then when we were ready, they became devotees. Although they might have said, you know, I was thinking about being a devotee for the last year, but I decided to do it now. It's like, yeah, I know why you decided. Because we're ready for you. So I think that's important in you know, saying the world, will people come by millions to our farms? Well, what if they did? Where would you put them? Maybe we should make a plan. Maybe you should buy a million yurts. If you have room for a million, what to do? You have to build tree houses, caves. Yeah. But I, I want to say something in this regard. Prabhupada's vision of spreading Krishna consciousness wasn't make a few devotees. It was like, massively change society, that's what he was thinking. So when he's saying millions will come, another way of saying it, get ready because we want millions to come. You could see it like that. That's our goal. And let's provide a better life for people. And it also means not everyone's going to be a devotee, but they'll be part of the society, part of the culture. Yes, you had another question? It's just, it's just that it seems like it it doesn't require war and war and the war is already there to some extent and if you just get the farm together and it's very attractive people yeah. will start coming yeah. maybe not by millions but could be by hundreds actually if you're looking for community yeah yeah Krishna will send Krishna will send that's the point and I think that was also maybe indirectly the point of last night's class when you create an environment in which people feel comfortable, they feel satisfied, they feel cared for, they don't feel judged or put down, then Krishna says, yes, this is, this is the place. I'm going to bring more people here because they'll be treated properly. They'll be taken care of. Right? You agree? Yeah. So that, in, in, I think I was telling you on the way here, that the most important, that in my mind is the most important thing to do for spreading Krishna consciousness, is create the environment. Because no matter how great you are, or great your books are, great your public kirtan is, when they come here, Prabhupada wanted them to see, this is Krishna consciousness in action. He wanted us, like Prabhupada said, the book just tells you what it's like, but here, we show you what it's like. You get to see it. And that's more powerful. Prabhupada started this village, Gita Nagari. And Gita, his idea with Gita Nagari was we will show the Gita in action. Come here, you'll see it in action. Because if you can't see it in action, how can you believe it actually works? Right? If you've been a devotee for 20 years and you're not happy, and you're not satisfied, and you're not becoming purified, what is somebody going to think who's new? Like, why would I waste my time? After 20 years, you're still a mess. <laughs> right? And obviously, if they see the opposite, they'll think, yeah, this is beautiful. I want to be this. I want to do this. I want to be like you. Yes. Thank you, Krishna. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering what are some of the practical things that we can do as a community to come together in order to create this sort of culture? I think you need to come together and talk about that very question, how we can do it. We had an exercise here. Maybe we should do it again. We had an exercise here a few years ago. And the question was, what experience do we want people to have when they come here? So those things I listed, like to feel accepted, to feel appreciated, not to be judged, to feel that here's a place of learning, a place of support spiritually, and so forth. 
then how do we create that environment and culture so that everyone experiences that? And that, that I think, even though we did the exercise, obviously you have to monitor it and say, okay, this is what we decided we wanted, how are we doing on a scale of one to 10? Maybe you can revisit that list of things we try to create. And I think it's also good to be conscious of what we don't want to create because we need to monitor that also. People are, maybe someone's feeling um, discriminated against, and so how, how can we prevent that? How can we help that? What can we do? We also talk about education. And I, I've often thought that it's, it's important for all of us to understand how to live in community, because we didn't grow up in community, unless you had a big family. I once, um, I brought a friend over to my house. He was in Mayapur, I just met him. He's a god brother from America. And I was like, come over, come over for breakfast. I didn't tell my wife, and my wife was doing puja. And she, my wife loves to take care of guests, like, like they're kings. And she saw him come in while she was doing puja, and she was upset because she was like, I can't take care of him now. And she kind of said something like off the top of her mind, like, why did you bring him now? And I said, oh, Prabhu, I'm sorry, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll make something for you. And he just started laughing. He goes, I have three sisters. I'm used to this. So if you're not used to living in an environment, a community, big family, there are things that would be helpful to learn. To like, number one, everybody's not perfect. Have you noticed that yet? Yeah. Even though we're devotees, we do have some little flaws here and there. How do we deal with that? There will there will be mistakes made. How do we deal with them? How do you process that internally? How do you relate to the people who make the mistake? You can relate in a very vicious way, in a very Thomasic way, which could be very destructive when you see an imperfection, when you see a problem. I think these things are really important. You're joining a community, so how do we deal within a community in a harmonious way? It takes some skills that maybe we don't have that we need to learn. I mean, I just had one sister, so I didn't have a big family. And pretty much I was independent. I didn't really have to like deal with anybody. But then I become a devotee, and I'm like sleeping in a room with 25 other men, you know, wall to wall, head to head. You know, and we shared our own clothes. We didn't even have our own clothes. We shared them. So whatever came back from the laundry, we just took. First come, first serve. You know, yeah, we're hippies. Commune, you know, commune. It's all belongs to everybody. But it's a different paradigm than having your own room and all your own possessions. So things like that can be helpful. How, what does it mean to be a contributing member of the community? How to be positive, make com positive contributions? If there are problems, how do you deal with it? How to take feedback? Wow, that's a big one. Do you like getting feedback? Do you like being told you did something wrong? Most of us don't. We like being told we did something right. You know? But on occasion, maybe you'll do something that hurts somebody and someone has to tell you, you did it. And, you know, the natural condition response is to defend yourself. Isn't it? We need to be able to learn how to take feedback. I've so, so often, devotees will make mistakes and you can't explain it to them. They won't listen. Or we disagree and we don't listen to one another. Have you ever seen that? Where we disagree and we won't try to understand the other person. We only want them to understand us. Have you, have you ever done that before? But Prabhu, you don't understand. Blah, 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 blah. No, you don't understand. Blah, 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 blah. I don't care what you said. You're wrong. Blah, blah, I'm right. Blah, 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 blah. You, know? you can't have a harmonious community if you don't have the skills of, okay, I understand what you're saying. You, you mean this. You feel this way. Okay, I understand. Acknowledging. So I would highly suggest developing these kinds of skills. Ability to take feedback, ability to listen, 
the ability to sort out conflicts. It's essential. Then you'll have an amazing community. And, and going through training and courses which show you how to do this. So now you have skills. When I go up to you and say, you know, you shouldn't have done that, and you're about to have a nervous breakdown and start crying and hide in your room for three days, you have skills now how to deal with it. And, and then you say, well, thank you for that. That's really helpful. I'm going to work on that. I appreciate it. And you'll appreciate the person who gave it to you rather than condemning them and making you feel like, I don't want to be here anymore. Right? We were talking, I was talking about this the other, the other day, how it's, it's, it's not normal for people to be empathic. It's normal for people to fight for what they believe is right. No, no, you don't understand what you're saying is wrong. No, it's like this. That's normal, isn't it? And I have the shloka to prove it, and I have the purport. Plus, I'm older than you, and I've got more degrees than you. So you know, just be quiet, you don't know anything. That's human nature. You know, human, human nature slashed with tilak. I'm wearing tilak, but I still have human nature. So the human nature side of us that can be harmful for a community, we have to address it. Because that kind of human nature may not go away, even in 50 years. And in fact, 50 years from now, you may think you're more right than you are today, because you have 50 years to prove it. <laughs> I'm just speaking from experience. I know for you it might sound, 50 years, you wouldn't become like, be able to take feedback. No, sometimes it gets worse, because you've had 50 years to think about what you believe to be right. So you're 50 times more convinced, and it's 50 times harder to listen to the other side. I, I appreciate so much devotees who disagree with me, but will listen to me and acknowledge what I said and why I said it and how I feel. I think that's beautiful. You can be like, you can totally disagree and be so close to such a person because they're trying to understand you. And we're different, so they see it differently. That's what makes a beautiful community. Otherwise, we create enemies. Who are your enemies? The people who think differently. I don't like that person. Why don't you like him? Because he believes this, and I don't. Right? You ever not like someone just simply because they believe something different from you? <coughs> and then we were talking yesterday, this statement, this is a killer. I just don't understand how you could believe that. That is an admission uh, that you have no empathy. When you say, I cannot understand how anyone could believe this, it means you lack empathy 100%. Because if you had empathy, you would never say that. You would say, I understand why someone believes that, I just don't believe it. That's what you would say. So if you ever catch yourself saying, I just don't understand why he would believe it, she would believe it, why anyone would believe it, Ding, 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 ding. You have an empathy issue. Or you may not want to understand. That's also what it means. I can't understand can also mean I don't want to. But you can't have a good community like that because we're going to disagree because we're different. Even though we have the same philosophy, the same books, we will disagree on something. You're a different generation. You see things differently. If you were born when I was born, you would see things differently. If I were born when you were born, I would see things differently. It's reality. We can't hide from it. Right? And you're going to come along and say, I think we should do it this way. And I'm going to say, but we've always done it this way. And you're going to say, yeah, but it's not going to work anymore because people don't think like that. And I have to sit there and say, okay, tell me more. I have to be open. And, and, or I have to explain why it's not going to work, and you have to be open. I say, well, there's a higher principle here. And you have, so that's what makes it community. Right? So I think any training that you can do that can help you be more empath empathetic, more cooperative, learn how to take feedback, learn how to give feedback with, uh, you know, really compassionately, that would just help tremendously. Because we don't, most people 
don't naturally do this. Do they? I mean, corporate world, people get trained to do this because your company is going to go bottom up if you've got leaders that are autocratic. Like this, everyone will leave. They'll all quit. You'll drive them crazy. So, yeah. Is that all right? Or is that too much to work on? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm wondering, when you say we should meet with these whiskey things, is this like a, a one-off or a regular thing that we can do? As often as needed until... It's nice to meet and discuss, and it's nice to monitor how things are going. You know, what do they say? Things, what is there saying? But you know, things that get measured get improved or something. Mm -hmm. Things, something like that. Yeah. Well, this is what we want to do. Let's measure it. How's it going? And what's beautiful about it is it sets a, a very sattvic mood. And if someone is really not inclined to sattva zoom, they won't like it. And maybe they're not the right person for the community. They won't fit in. Because they won't take feedback and, and they won't know how to, to complain in a sattvic way. That creates harmony. They'll complain and create disharmony. So it also helps in people identifying if this is their community or not. Because we have certain standards. This is how we do it. If you have a problem, you don't talk behind someone's back. You go to them and respectfully discuss it. If that's the standard, and you have people who like to gossip behind other people's backs, then they don't fit in. So it also helps helps in understanding who who should who would fit in a community like this and who wouldn't. I mean, hopefully everybody would, but occasionally someone won't, and I think it will be clear that they just can't do this. They can't be empathetic, and it doesn't work, because we're all trying to be empathetic. Or they, they can't take feedback, or we need to be able to correct one another. And that's part of being humble, isn't it? You know this story? It's so funny. There was a... Well, I don't know if it's funny, but it's insightful. There was a... Um, I believe it was the inst installation of Radha Vandeshwar, and there were like so many things going wrong, and Prabhupada was so concerned um, that the deities were not being offended. So anything with the deities, you would see sometimes Prabhupada would be very upset with any offenses were being made. In. And at this point, Prabhupada was really upset, and he was getting angry. And there was some new person who you know, been to the temple like twice or something. And he went up to Prabhupada and he said, don't be angry, just chant Hare Krishna. Mm -hmm. And Prabhupada just started chanting. <laughs> yeah. Wow, it's true. It's exactly. Right. Wow. Hare Krishna. Should we stop now? Or if I go further, will I get myself in trouble? <laughs> Or is it too late? I'm already in trouble. I'm not, I'm not saying these things specifically pointed to any particular community. It's just general. I mean, it's not, I'm not pointing out that you have this specific problem. That's what I'm saying. These are just principles that I see if you don't have these. It just, there are so many problems will come as a byproduct. And all this energy you could be putting into proactively to train yourself, you're going to be putting into solving problems. But they'll keep coming up, because you, if you have, if you don't have these skills, then the problems will keep coming up. I'm not understood. Uh, people are, are dealing with me in a, in a way that's, that's discouraging me and so forth. So I think we need these things. I know a lot of people who agree with me, and they're mostly people who train in these areas, who are devotees, who see that although we're good devotees, we're conditioned souls, and we, we may not carry everything necessary to create the best relationships. And you can be a great devotee and have bad relationships, although it seems like a contradiction, but maybe you never had a good relationship in your life. And so you, that's just your nature, and you need to learn how to do it. Or maybe you had bad relationships, and now you don't want any relationship, because you just 
figure that it's going to be bad and I'll suffer like I did before. So we need to deal with these things, right? I mean, anyone who's been married, they understand this. Like, nobody's prepared for marriage. You have no idea what it's going to be like. And that's why you have marriage counseling. And it makes it so much easier because then you, then you know what to do. It's like, otherwise, it's like you're put in the pilot seat of an airplane. And you have no idea what to do. Well, I can drive a truck. I should be able to fly an airplane. No. <laughs> so you think, you know, I have so many friends, I can get married. I know how to do it. No, you don't. You need to learn. It's just different. So you can be a good devotee and not know. It doesn't mean you'll know. I mean, you would think you would, but it's not true. Right? Have you seen that? Some of the best devotees do not have the best marriages. It's just, it's not necessarily, they don't necessarily go together, <coughs> although you would think they would, but they don't necessarily. <coughs> it's just a reality. Have you, is that enough? Should we take breakfast or what? We want more? Well, if anyone has a comment or question, we can continue, but if not, then... I just want to make a comment. Yeah, please. That was, uh, she, you were saying in class that uh, sometimes the devotee has been the same way for 50 years. And uh, <clears throat> is it a healthy sign that uh, a devotee changes his story? So he says, you know, you know, an event takes place and he gives a very accurate uh, analysis of what took place. But should it not be a healthy sign that, you know, 10 years later, he uh, refers back to the same incident, but the story has totally changed. He has a totally different perspective. Well, it's the same, all the same facts. A, a positive perspective, or a healthy perspective. Yeah. yeah, hopefully. Better way to understand it and deal with it. Yeah. But even if the, well, whatever happened was perhaps unjust, unfair, you know, very difficult for that devotee. But if we're growing, we will learn to work through it in a way that we come out better and stronger. Hopefully. You know, if something bad happens to you, then you should think, well, it's just an opportunity for me to, to work through a problem in a way that I, I'll come out the other end better. And next time it happens, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to um, react in the same way. There was a, a fairy tale story of, a, of an angel and a little boy. And the angel told the little boy, every life you have an opportunity to develop divine qualities. What quality would you like to develop in this life? He said, the boy said, in this life, I would like to develop forgiveness. So the angel said, okay, so what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna come back in another form and I will be your enemy. And the boy was shocked. He said, why would you do that? He said, well, if you don't have an enemy, how can you learn to forgive? So if, you know, I have to look, we all have to learn tolerance, right? So, okay. You want to learn tolerance? Okay, if you do, I'll get somebody to go and bother you today and harass you, like sit next to you and say, can I have all your prasada? <laughs> can I have your sweets? And could you move over? Uh, you move over and bang you with your elbows. And, you know, you need something to tolerate to practice tolerance. You need someone to do something to hurt you to practice forgiveness. So, so, if you understand this, then when these things happen, you'll think, okay, Krishna, I know what you're doing. You're giving me opportunity here. Because if I don't have the opportunity, I won't learn it. And you, you don't want to pass up this opportunity to go through this situation and come out bitter and feel like a victim and hate everybody and everything. That would be the biggest loss. When you could learn how to go through it, come out the other end. Like, as Hooks is just saying, with a story, 
of not that I am a victim and every the world's crashing on me, but I'm a stronger person. I've, I've become more understanding of why this happened, more accepting, perhaps more compassionate towards the people who hurt me and understanding why they did that and that they're not bad people and so forth. Otherwise, you get trapped and your whole life you'll have this story, I was victimized. You'll go to your grave, we'll put it on your gravestone. I was a victim, I was hurt. Why would you want to do that? Does it make sense? Does it? Unless you don't like yourself, yeah. If you don't like yourself, do it. If that's a really good way to like harm yourself, let it go. And we are very good at harming ourselves. That's a fact. Nobody can harm you like you. That's a good t-shirt, isn't it? Nobody can harm you like you. Make that t-shirt, Chaitanya does. Make it right now. If we have an artist, they could just make one-offs, right? No, oh, it's just going to make one-offs for you. Okay, anything else? Story, it's all about your story. Read the Bhagavatam, you'll get a new view on life. Different, yeah. Ambrish Maharaj. Severely offended by Dravasa. Offended in a way no one of us will ever be offended like that. What was his reaction? Did he go to court? Did he retaliate? No, because he's a pure devotee. He accepted it. Whatever. Amazing. Difficult to imitate, but it's there. It's an example. Somebody trying to kill him. No problem. He comes back, right? And he asks for forgiveness. For what? He didn't do anything wrong. Inconceivable, right? Why did he say that? Because everything happens by the will of Krishna. So how could it be wrong? Can we think like that? We have to start thinking that way. Maybe there's a reason it happened. Maybe it's something I'm supposed to learn. And I'm so stubborn, I just complain the rest of my life and I don't learn anything. That's unfortunate, isn't it? And Krishna sometimes arranges situations for us to learn. And he will do things that are very upsetting for us. Because it's the only way we can learn. And if we miss the opportunity, what a misfortune that is. Hare Krishna. Krishna's giving you tough love. Take it and you'll be, you'll be, you'll be able to go through life in a very easy way because you know how to navigate difficulty. Wouldn't it be great when you get feedback? Your immediate response is, thank you for that. I appreciate it so much. Wouldn't that be nice? If that's your initial response. Or you're going through a difficulty and say, I'm trying to learn the lesson here. You're not blaming anybody. You're just looking at what's the lesson. Wouldn't that be a better way to live? Isn't that the kind of community we want? Isn't that the way we want to train ourselves? No one would blame anybody. We'd all just we'd all be learning. That would be amazing. And that's Christian consciousness. And that's why, that's why I like to teach these things, because it is Krishna consciousness. It's like, you know, we have this like Krishna conscious theory, but, and we miss the Krishna consciousness when you bring it down to the, the rubber hit, hitting the road. This is rubber hitting the road. Oh, it's such a nice story of Ambarish Maharaj and he was so forgiving. Yeah. Yeah, but what about you? <laughs> yeah. I have a whole list of people I hate. So why do you think that's what's so nice about the story? Oh, it just feels good to read it. It's purifying to read the Bible down. No. There's another level we have to take the story to. That's into our life right now. When something happens, and you, you know, wasn't nice, think of Ambarish Maharaj. How did he react? And how are you reacting? Is there a difference? Can you be more like him? How to be more like him? How to think? Everything happens for a reason. Everything is a karmic reaction or Krishna's arrangement. Has something happened to you that you didn't think was a karmic reaction, but it was someone else's fault? You didn't think it was Krishna's arrangement, it was someone else's fault? Of course. 
that's how we become our own enemy. We don't blame ourselves, we blame the other person. Okay, the person did something wrong. But how does karma play out? Did I have nothing to do with it? Well, according to Bhagavatam, I did. And Krishna was just protecting me by creating a problem. So I could learn. You can think that way, you can live that way. You can actually do it. You don't have to be a great devotee. There are millions of people in the world who are not devotees, who have been trained to think like this. Did you know that? There are courses around the world. They're, they're not Krishna conscious per se, but they teach people these things. And, and your average, average person on the street often is better able to deal with these things than devotees. I've seen it because I've been to these courses. And it's really weird to see somebody going through a difficulty better than a devotee. And you know why? Because they've taken this philosophy of karma and they've brought it down in a practical way so that you can work through it step by step and you can actually see the lessons in it. You're taught to see the lessons. But if it's just the philosophy, you can say, yeah, it's karma, action, reaction, and then you don't see the lessons in your own life. And then you don't avail yourself of it. So, ladies and gentlemen, Krishna consciousness is practical, but you have to bring it down to the practical level. Otherwise, we have devotees who know the philosophy who are acting like they don't know the philosophy. Have you seen that before? That's, that's the theoretical level. They know the philosophy, but they're acting exactly in the opposite way. You have to bring it down. What does this look like in, in, in real life? Am I acting in a way that's in alignment with our philosophy? Somebody took my shoes, I'm ready to kill somebody. Oh, they're expensive shoes. Where is it? I get my knife out, you know. Well, that's what you used to do before you were devoted. You don't do it now. Right? You learn how to deal with it. That's what it means. I hope. You better stop now, right? I think that's enough for one class, right? Uh, thank you very much for listening. I hope you learned something. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Hare Hare. Blessings to the audience. Jai Shri Mahaprabhu Ki Jai Jai Go Premanand Kaur Bhakti Vrinda Ki Jai Hare Krishna Hare Krishna I would like to thank Mahaprabhu for this wonderful lecture and we will be back here at the temple room at 11 a.m. Uh, to the next session that is called Living the Wisdom of Bhakti mm. which is based on mm. Mahaprabhu We already started that section I think we already started that class. Yes, it has been. I think for the last couple of days now. And we kind of selected four topics and some of them were already, I think, very true. Because it was let go of resentment, the challenges of sexual purity, cooperation strategies, amending yourself instead of fault finding others. You know, you could focus more on cooperation strategies, the challenges of sexual purity, because you kind of spoke about resentment and fault finding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay.